Okay, so in this discussion, I'm going to go over climate change. Um, I'll focus on what I'm calling the five facts of climate change, which pretty closely follows um, one of the readings that I posted. Uh, but I'll go over some other issues as well. So we'll go over the basic science. What is the greenhouse effect? What are greenhouse gases? So I want to make sure you understand the science. We're going to look at the impacts of humans on climate change. Um, what are the overall causes and consequences of them? Um, is there wide agreement on this uh, issue? And what if we're wrong about climate change? That's the last little piece, okay? So I want to start by being very clear. This is really, really important that you know that there is very wide agreement that we must be carbon neutral by approximately 2050 globally, okay? Um, if we want to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. This also means we need to cut our emissions by about half by 2030. So what does carbon neutral mean? It means that um, to the extent possible, we want to eliminate our emissions of CO2, things like, you know, um, from power plants and vehicles and farming and so forth. So we can emit, with carbon neutrality, we can emit some CO2, but whatever CO2 we do emit, we have to absorb an equal amount through, um, I guess, purposeful means. So not just having, you know, nature absorb CO2, which it does already, but actually adding to the capacity of nature to absorb CO2, or there are certain machines that can do it. Okay, so carbon neutral by 2050, absolutely essential that you remember that. That is the goal widely agreed upon, okay? Which means we can emit some emissions, but anything we do emit must be absorbed. Okay, so this is a chart of emissions, okay? Um, from 1990 through 2100, so obviously it's a projection. Um, and then here's your green, greenhouse gas emissions. So this is carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. Um, so the black line is the historical. Okay, so you can see we've been going up a lot, uh, our emissions every year, pretty significantly. And then these are all projections. Okay, here's our, um, under current policies, this is where we're headed. Okay, that's where we're headed. If everyone lives up if all the countries in the world and all the businesses in the world live up to their uh, pledges, we'll get down to about here, uh, which is not awful, but it's definitely not great. So that's 2.6 degrees. We're trying to keep it under one and a half if possible. Okay, so this is where we're headed, really. This is where we could very well be headed. This is like, yeah, things get better, right? So most people hold up to their um, targets plus a little more. And then here's what we really need to do, okay? So we really need, again, um, we should be down here. You can see it's a, around 2050, we should be net zero, right? So it's a little bit after, but we should be approximately net zero by 2050, okay? So that's where we need to go, that's where we're headed. And climate change, uh, one reason it's so important to understand is it's this you can consider it almost like the mother of all sustainability problems it's this huge problem that more than any other issue um it'll it's going to impact all these other sustainability problems so everything that we talk about in this class from water to food to energy transportation um community development you name it all of it is impacted by climate change certainly social justice and social uh, and, and equity is a huge part of climate um it's called climate justice normally so this is the, the problem that sort of is just like looming all over, over all of these other problems. Okay, so it's what, there's a term called wicked problems. Feel free to look it up. It's like these really complex problems. Okay, so the, the, one of the things that's important to remember, systems thinking, as we've gone over from week one or lesson one, systems thinking is absolutely essential. We need to look at all the impacts. We need to look at all the causes and how they're all intertwined. Okay, so this is a really big, huge issue um, is something that, excuse me, something that um, ha offers a lot of opportunities, okay? So let's go over some basic terminology. So the greenhouse effect is just a term that's used to describe the phenomenon um, whereby these gases in the atmosphere absorb certain types of radiation, okay? And then they emit, they don't absorb other types. It's, I'll, I'll get into details here. So the greenhouse effect is like this overall thing that happens in the atmosphere that keeps the earth warmer than it would be otherwise. It's kind of like having a blanket in the atmosphere, but not quite. Now, the greenhouse effect itself is actually a good thing because it makes life possible on planet earth. It keeps the planet warm enough for liquid water. I mean, we wouldn't be here without the greenhouse effect. Um, so you go somewhere like Mars, which has very little atmosphere and there's very little greenhouse effect. It gets really cold at night, and really hot during the day. So our greenhouse effect keeps us alive. 
The problem is the enhanced greenhouse effect um, is that extra greenhouse effect that's caused by humans by emitting all these gases into the atmosphere. Um, a greenhouse gas, again, is the gas that absorbs certain types of radiation and doesn't absorb other types. And again, I'll go over this in more detail in a minute. A general term, anthropogenic, you should jot that down. That's uh, anything that's caused by humans. Okay, so if you look at the root, anthro means uh, people, like um, anthropology, um, for example. And then um, genic means is coming from the root genesis, which means beginning, right? So caused by humans. So anything that's caused by humans, you can have anthropogenic climate change, you can have anthropogenic biodiversity loss, whatever. Anthropogenic just means it's caused by humans. And then you have your AGW, anthropogenic uh, climate change, which is the component of climate change that's uh, believed to be and is caused by humans, okay? So there's some basic terminology. So let's start with these five facts. So facts num fact number one is that we know that greenhouse gases have trap heat in the atmosphere. Um, and without it, life would not be possible. And there's a video on this, but I'll go over kind of the highlights. Um, so this is something that nobody disputes, no, no legitimate person disputes. Um, the greenhouse effect, we know this, this is how it works. Um, and so you have the sun, which emits mostly shortwave radiation, okay, um, invisible light. And that uh, goes toward the earth. And then there's, in this, we have our atmosphere, right? So here's the surface of the earth. And here's our atmosphere, okay, so um, you know, 100, 200 miles thick, depending on where you are and the time of year. So this sunlight, there's a, there's a bunch of greenhouse gases in here, carbon dioxide, methane, and so forth. So the sunlight that comes through is short wave radiation. And what happens is the short wave just passes right through the greenhouse gases. It's, they're basically invisible to the short wave radiation. It's just a, a physical property of them. So this sunlight, almost all of it gets, well, about half of it, I think, um, gets through. Okay, so it passes right through the greenhouse gases. Now it'll bounce off little particles in the atmosphere and the tops of clouds and that sort of thing. But all of that short wave radiation that, that comes, it just passes right through the greenhouse gases. Okay, so then one of two things happens. If it hits something that it reflects, that it reflects off of, okay, then it's still shortwave radiation, like a, a light colored surface outside or whatever, you know, a, a water on a lake that's really glassy, whatever the case may be. If that reflects, that means it's not being absorbed. So it's still shortwave. And if it reflects, it's gonna go back out as shortwave. And again, it, it greenhouse gases just don't interact with that shortwave, okay? So that reflected radiation will just likely bounce right back out. The second possibility is if it's absorbed by something. So like if you would walk outside on a sunny day and your skin or your clothes and your clothes and everything absorb that sunlight that hits you, then you actually heat up a little bit and then you radiate energy back out. And that happens to everything out there. You know, look outside, grass, trees, animals, houses, streets, whatever. That absorbs radiation and then it re-emits it back out. Now when it re-emits it, it re-emits it as infrared, okay, or long wave radiation. And here's the key. That long wave radiation, just because of the physical properties of greenhouse gases, it's absorbed by the greenhouse gases, okay? And then those greenhouse gases absorb it, and then they then warm up, and they radiate it in all directions, okay? So you have this little, like, let me see if I can draw a little picture here. Um, you have, like, a little greenhouse gas molecule here, and this radiation comes, sorry. And the radiation sort of comes up and hits it, right? It absorbs it, and then this radiates that in all directions. Okay, so this way and that way, okay? And so just imagine there's like you know, hundreds of trillions of these little molecules in the atmosphere. And, and that's really the key. So then some of this um, heat goes back toward the surface of the earth and that keeps it warmer. Okay, so that's, that's the greenhouse effect. Short wave radiation comes in, passes through the greenhouse gases. If it's reflected, it bounces back through the greenhouse gases out to space. If it's absorbed by anything on or near the surface, then it's re-radiated as long wave and then the greenhouse gases do absorb that and then they, um, uh, re-radiated in all directions. Okay, so that's your basic greenhouse effect. 
Okay. Um, I want to make sure that you don't get confused here. The ozone layer has almost nothing to do with climate change. Okay, so ozone is ozone is the layer in the upper atmosphere in the stratosphere that protects us from ultraviolet radiation. So ozone absorbs ultraviolet, not not uh, long wave radiation. Okay, so ozone layer is not does not have anything to do with climate change. So I just want to be clear because a lot of people seem to get confused with that. So to summarize, the sun emits mostly short wave visible radiation. Greenhouse gases do not absorb that. If that radiation is reflected, it usually goes back out to space, passes right through the greenhouse gases. If that short wave is absorbed, it's re-emitted as a long wave, and the greenhouse gases absorb and re-emit um, that, and about 50% of it goes back toward the surface, right? Because it's radiating in all directions, so about half goes down, half goes up and sideways, okay? And that's what keeps us alive, one of the things anyway. Um, I do want to address the concept of positive feedback loops. Um, this is a, a pretty important concept in sustainability. So positive uh, feedback loop is something that's self-reinforcing. Okay, so as you get more of it, it causes more, more of the same, basically. So uh, um, um, a really important one um, in climate change is there's actually multiple positive feedback loops out there. One of them is um, ice cover. Okay, so... You probably know that white uh, light colored objects are very reflective. Okay, so we have these ice caps on the North and South Pole, um, Greenland, and so forth. So they reflect a lot of the energy, solar energy coming in. Remember, that solar energy that comes in and is reflected goes right back through. So that doesn't cause warming. Okay, it, it's bouncing, goes right out of space. So it, it does not warm the Earth. So you can imagine as the climate warms, what's going to happen to the ice caps? Well, they're going to start melting. Well, what happens when you start melting ice caps? There's less ice to reflect that um, in incoming radiation. And so as this shrinks, more radiation absorbed by land masses and the ocean and so forth. So as it warms, it shrinks the ice cap, which then causes more warming, which then shrinks the ice cap more, which causes, right, you can see how that can become, you know, kind of a, a big problem. Another one is permafrost. So permafrost is a ground that's permanently frozen. There's a lot of this all over the world. You know, Russia's a big, you know, I think you go really far north, the ground is always frozen. Well, that has um, locked, locked up carbon and methane in it. And so as that melts, so again, planet warms, permafrost starts to melt, releases some methane and carbon dioxide, and then you get more warming, and then you get more melting and more warming, right? So this is these positive feedback loops that are really important. And climate models are actually kind of not very good at, at modeling this. So these are some things that uh, may cause increased warming in the future. Uh, we may reach like a, um, a, um, like a sort of a breaking point where we, uh, a tipping point where it's like, it just can get out of control. So we have to be really careful about these positive feedback loops. Okay, so that's the basics of the greenhouse effect. Um, important science to understand. It's really not too complicated. Okay, we, uh, so we know what the greenhouse effect does, and we know what greenhouse gases do. The second fact is we know that humans are causing concentrations of greenhouse gases to increase, and we know that the number one source of emissions, <coughs> excuse me, is energy use. So there are a bunch of greenhouse gases. The main ones that we deal with are carbon dioxide and methane, so you want to jot those down, CO2 and CH4. This is a chart that shows the, um, you can see the blue line is methane, the red is carbon dioxide. Okay, this is from, you know, there's no year zero, but you know, um, 2000 years ago or 20, you know, 2000 ish years ago. Um, and this is the concentration, which is the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Okay, so you can see the methane line, boom, 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 and right around 17, 1800, it really shoots up. CO2, pretty steady, pretty steady, pretty steady, 17, 1800 really shoots up. So what do you think happened here? Um, if you know anything about history, like basic, basic Western civilization history, and global history, this is right around the time of the Industrial Revolution, right? So we started burning a lot of fossil fuels at that time. And not coincidentally, as we burn more fossil fuels, the concentrations went up, okay? So some other important points um, to point out. When you use the term concentration, that's that's what scientists use to describe the amount of um, 
greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. It's really a percentage, um, but concentration goes up. That means there's more there. Um, and also greenhouse gases are distributed relatively equally globally. So, you know, I drive to work and I emit some CO2 out of my tailpipe. That just goes up in the atmosphere and eventually it just all mixes around. So it's not like, you know, in the U.S., because we have so many emissions, like the CO2 here is a lot higher than over, I don't know, southern Peru or whatever, where, you know, in the mountains where they're not really burning many fossil fuels. It's just everywhere, right? So I made it here, I made it in China, I made it in Mongolia, I made it in Russia. It doesn't matter. Um, it just goes globally, okay? So we need, this is a global problem. Um, some other, you know, points to point out. Um, CO2 is measured in parts per million, um, whereas methane is a little bit smaller. Uh, global warming potential, I don't want to get into the weeds too much. I'd have to be happy to elaborate on this if you want. But you may hear that um, methane is about 30 times as powerful as CO2. Okay, so remember, methane and carbon dioxide are our two main greenhouse gases. Methane, they, you, if, if you're paying attention, they'll say like methane is about 30 times as potent as CO2. What that, what that refers to is that if you look at the impact on the climate, so how much a one ton of emissions will warm the climate over 100 years, carbon dioxide is your base level. Okay, so one ton of CO2 has so much warming. Methane, one ton of that, will have about 30 times the warming of one ton of CO2. So that's global warming potential. And CO2 is your, your basic unit. So anything that's more potent than CO2 has a higher than one global warming potential. Okay, and actually everything, all of our greenhouse gases have bigger than one. Some have the thousands, like CFCs and these refrigeration units. Um, anyway, so that's when you hear methane and CO2. So methane is actually much more potent, much, much more potent, about 30 times more. So if I emit a ton of methane, a ton of CO2, that methane is going to do about 30 times as much warming as that ton of CO2. Okay. So why are we worried most about CO2? I mean, if methane is so potent, why is CO2? I mean, I'm sure you hear about CO2 more than anything. Um, I'll answer that question in a minute. So I want to kind of... If you, if you look at the um, concentration of CO2 over time, we've been measuring it directly since 1958. Okay, this is called the Keeling Curve. So 1958, direct measurements, there's a machine on the top of this mountain in Hawaii um, that's been measuring it, right? And, you know, I don't think it takes a scientist or an analytics expert to see what's happening here, right? So it's going up, 1958 to this is like 2022. So it's going up. So why is it going up? I want to kind of bring this back to a basic tenet of sustainability that we've talked about before. And that is that we cannot emit waste faster than they can be safely absorbed by the environment. Remember, that was one of our fundamental things, right? So we can't use waste, um, emit waste faster than they can be absorbed. Remember, we can't use resources faster than they can be replenished. So this is the result of emitting more CO2 than the earth can reabsorb. And I'll go over the carbon cycle in a minute. But this, this is, it, it's really a, a, a pretty basic, kind of like a math problem. How much do we emit? How much does the earth absorb? And if we emit more than we absorb, it's going to go up, right? Just like if you eat more calories than you burn, you're going to gain weight. Same thing. Um, same principle anyway, right? So again, these principles, these overarching principles in this class um, apply to this uh, as well on a number of um, levels. So just to give you a sense of scale, like, is, does this matter? Is this really a big deal? Like, it's a planet? Like, is that normal? So just to give you a sense. So CO2 levels have increased about 50% in the last 170 years, okay? So about, about 50%. The last time that CO2 levels rose 50% was after the last ice age, okay? So that was 20,000 years ago, give or take. So how long after the last ice age did it take for CO2 levels to go up by 50%? Was it 200 years, 500, 2000, or 20,000? Okay, so again, it's only taken about 170, 150 years to almost double our CO2 concentration. How long did it norm, quote unquote normally take? And the answer is actually about 20,000 years. So after the last ice age, it took about 20,000 years to increase CO2 levels by 50%. And then we took only humans kind of get on the 
you know, get on the scene and start to burn all these fossil fuels and so forth. So what took before 20,000 years took 150 years, right? So it's not, you know, CO2 levels always change. And you'll hear people say, yeah, the planet's always changing and CO2 levels are always changing. And that is 100% true. And we know that there's these Milankovitch cycles that operate on these long-term scales. Yes, CO2 changes. It always has and it always will. Even humans um, aren't here. The problem is the scale of the change, the rate of the change that we are really expediting it. We're making it go so much faster than it normally does. And if you look at the CO2 levels, we have ways of measuring through proxy measurements the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere over hundreds of thousands of years. Okay, so here's like 400,000 years ago. You can see CO2 goes up and down and up and down. But here's where we are now, right? So higher than 400,000 years. For 800,000 years, up, down, up, down, up, and here's where we are now, right? So we are, our concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere is higher than it's been probably for the last million years plus. And, and this is a chart that shows um, in uh, pink is the um, temperature, and then these other lines are CO2 concentrations over the last 800,000 years. So you can see that um, the temperature and the CO2 levels are closely related. And again, here's where, here's where we are up here right now, right at the top here, off, almost off the chart, okay? So back to that question, why do we care about carbon dioxide? If you look at the total greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S. here uh, in, on the left, about 80% of our impact on the climate is CO2, about 10% is methane, okay? So this includes all of that additional, you know, methane is 30 times more potent, what this chart says is that CO2 is 80% of our impact on the climate. Methane is only 10. And then we have these other minor gases. And globally, it's the same story. CO2, 76% of the impact. Methane, 16, right? So that's the point. So CO2, if you look at the, the, um, the impact on the climate that we're having, this green is CO2. The red is uh, methane. Then we have nitrous oxide and so forth. Okay? So, I mean, CO2, huge Again, CO2 is the green, 1990, 1995, 2000, 2005, 2010. So CO2 is just the, the main um, impact on the climate. So that's why we care so much about CO2, okay? Because CO2 is our, the primary impact on the climate that humans are causing is from CO2, not from the other greenhouse gases, even though other greenhouse gases are more potent. Um, and to give you a sense of that whole, like, you know, emitting waste and reabsorbing them. So the earth is really good at reabsorbing CO2, um, does it all the time, emits, um, you know, the earth through things like the ocean actually absorbs CO2, the soil actually absorbs CO2, um, plants, of course, absorb CO2. So the earth is really good at absorbing it and then it emits it as well. So the problem is the earth absorbs a whole bunch hundreds of billions of tons of CO2 per year, and humans only add about, you know, 30 or 40, okay? So why are we so worried about human emissions? It's like a drop in the bucket compared to what the Earth can naturally absorb, right? So 29 billion tons versus the Earth can absorb like 800 million, or excuse me, 800 billion tons. So it's really a drop in the bucket. But the problem is that the Earth is sort of in a somewhat of a balance, and so we're just adding just enough past the amount that they can absorb, that the earth can safely absorb. And so it's that concentration is creeping up. So it's just like, you know, um, if you eat an extra, say, 50 calories a day and your body will burn, you know, 2000 or so. OK, so you eat a little. It's just a little bit more than you burn. Well, what's going to happen over time is you're going to gain weight. I mean, it's just going to be slow and steady. It's not going to you're not going to balloon up overnight, but you will gain weight. Same principle here. Just, just enough CO2 that the Earth just can't quite reabsorb it. And so those concentration, as you saw that chart, just kind of creep up slowly. All right, so that's a really important. Um, and that's what's causing this, right? So the, we emit more than the Earth can absorb, and it goes up. We emit more than the Earth can absorb, it goes up. Okay? And if you look at where they're coming from, all of the CO2 emissions, okay, this is a chart of... Uh, CO2 emissions in the U.S., different sectors. So let's go, the, go through these one by one. Transportation, where's, what's causing the CO2 emissions in transportation? Burning fossil fuels, right? What about electricity sector? Where do the emissions come from there? 
burning fossil fuels, coal, natural gas mostly. What about industry? Guess what? Fossil fuels, right? So coal and oil and natural gas. What about in your houses and in, and in you know residential commercial buildings? What's causing the CO2 there? Fossil fuels, right? Burning natural gas, burning heating oil, whatever. So the, the short story is almost all of our anthropogenic emissions, almost all of them, you know, this little sliver that comes not from fossil fuels. So what's the, the bottom line is the most effective way to reduce emissions is to reduce our fossil fuel use. And so that's why if you're uh, paying attention to climate change at all, you're going to hear people talk about fossil fuel use because, and this is why, I mean, our impact on the climate, remember it's like 80% CO2 and of that CO2, about 90% plus is from burning fossil fuels. So if we want to reduce our CO2 emissions, we have to reduce our fossil fuel use, period. That's it. I mean, there's some other minor things, land use change and so forth, but that's it. Okay. And just to give you a sense of how much, um, this is some updated data. So according to the updated data, what percent of global CO2 emissions are from energy use? Is it 29? Is it, uh, what does it say, 52, 73, or 85? And the answer is about 73%. Okay, so here's a nice, really good illustration of that. Um, and I provided a link here so you can look, look into it, but this is global emissions, about 73% is from energy use. And you can see we have some agriculture and so forth, right? So again, if we wanna reduce our emissions, we need to um, reduce our fossil fuel use. Okay, so that's the uh, facts number one and two. So we know that greenhouse gases trap heat in the atmosphere and we know that humans are causing concentrations to increase. And we'll get to fact three here in the next video.